Revelation chapter 4. Only 11 verses in this chapter. I want to read it every time we come together until we have finished our study of it. And while you're opening your Bibles, if you don't already have them open, folks, I'm going to be, I'm a disciplinarian. And when I move, I won't be able to walk as early as I do now because we don't have street lights up there. And I might stumble around and fall. But I'll have to wait to daybreak, which would be a good time to walk. <clears throat> but I'm a disciplinarian, and that disciplined life will continue. I have a lot of things I want to do in the study of the Scriptures, a lot of research work on various subjects that I want to explore. And so I'll do that because that means more to me than anything else. Let's read the fourth chapter of Revelation. After these things, not after this, we have a plural adjective, folks, and it's correctly translated in your interlinear. After these things I saw, and behold, a door has been opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here. That's an imperative, and I put in parentheses, at once. Come up here, and I will show you things which must occur after these things. Immediately I came into the sphere of inspiration, and behold, a throne was set. That is an imperfect verb, was set in heaven, and one sitting on the throne. And the one sitting was in appearance like a jasper and a carnelian stone. And there was a rainbow or halo radiance around the throne. And then he says, like an emerald in appearance. Verse 4, And around the throne there were twenty-four thrones, and on the thrones twenty-four elders. Now, who are the elders? Oh, there's a lot of debate, discussion as to who they really are. Just as there is a lot of debate among commentators, as you will find if you do any study, as to who John actually saw. Did he see Christ? Or did he see the Godhead? Or did he see God the Father? Now keep that in mind, and we'll discuss those things. Verse 4, And around the throne there were twenty-four thrones, and on the thrones twenty-four elders sitting, who have been clothed. Notice the way I translated that. Who have been clothed in white garments and on their heads golden crowns. And out from the throne proceeds lightnings and thunders and voices and seven lamps of fire are burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was a sea clear as glass, like crystal, and in the midst of the throne. Now you have that same terminology. You remember back in the first chapter, Christ in the midst of the assemblies. 
now here in the midst of the throne. Could be translated in the middle of the throne. And around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and on the back. And the first living creature, I don't translate the word in the Greek here, beast, as you have in the King James. I translate it living creature. Was like a lion. That speaks of majesty. Why do I say it speaks of majesty? Because when you get to the very next chapter, the Lord Jesus is seen not as the lamb that was slain, but as the lion of the tribe of Judah. Now keep the word lion in mind. Speaks of majesty. And the second living creature, like a calf or bull. And that speaks of endurance. And the third living creature, having the face like a man, that refers to intelligence. And then he says, and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle, and that speaks of speed of action. Oh, I mean, when the lion of the tribe of Judah starts acting, folks, it's going to be with speed. Keep that in mind. Now, verse 8. And the four living creatures, each one by one, is having six wings, and they are full of eyes around, and they are having no day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God the Almighty, the one who was, which we have already seen used several times in our studies thus far in chapter 1, and the one who is, and the one who is coming. And when the living creature shall give glory and honor and thanks to the one sitting on the throne, to the one living forever and ever, or just the one living for eternity. I just added that. Translation, leave it as it is. It's okay, forever and ever. Verse 10 the four and twenty elders shall fall down before the one sitting on the throne, and they shall worship the one living forever and ever, and shall cast their crowns before the throne, saying, You are worthy, our Lord, and God, to receive the glory and the honor and the power because you created all things, and for the sake of your desire, they exist and were created. Let's go back to the very first verse, for we will only look at the first three verses and not as exhaustively as we want to this morning, even these first three verses. But let's get the context. Let's get the context. And the context has to do with Laodicea. And Laodicea speaks of apostasy. Notice I said apostasy. So Jesus Christ, as the high priest commissioned John in chapter 1 as prophet. He was a prophet. He was prophesying. He was under the influence, the control, if you please, of the Holy Spirit. He was in the sphere of the Spirit. He was therefore in the sphere of inspiration. 
just as he was in the sphere of inspiration in chapter 1 on the Lord's day, a day belonging to or related to the Lord. But now, this is the second vision when we turn to chapter 4. The second vision. So going back to chapter 1, the Lord Jesus as the high priest, also as the high priest, he is the judge in the midst of the assemblies, chapter 1. Judging the assemblies, because judgment must begin at the house of God. Now folks, I want to, don't want to be misunderstood, but I want to be understood on this. Discipline is not easy to perform, to execute, folks. It can take it out of you. But I'm here to tell you this morning that any institution that does not exercise discipline is not an assembly of Jesus Christ. I said it is not an assembly of Jesus Christ. I don't care how prosperous she may appear to be. I don't care how many members she has. I don't care how many professions of faith she claims. Any assembly that does not exercise discipline is not an assembly of Christ. I realize that's a strong statement. Exercising discipline is difficult. An assembly can perform it. An assembly will perform it. You know why? Because it is the duty of the assembly to do so. And it can be done and will be done by the grace of God. Because it's the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do. So the Lord Jesus is seen in chapter 1. The Lord Jesus commissioned John as prophet. He judged the assemblies in chapters 2 and 3. He judged the assemblies. Walked among them. He's walking. He's here this morning. He's passing judgment on you and me right now. This very moment, he's judging us. He's judging us according to the opportunities we have and what are we doing with the opportunities which we have. He's judging us. Then, think about chapter 4 now, the second vision. Now the Lord Jesus prepares to come forth from the throne that is being set, was set, imperfect. And he'll come forth as the lion of the tribe of Judah. Not as the lamb that was slain, but as the lion of the tribe of Judah. That's chapter 5, but I drew from it because chapters 4 and 5 must be studied as a unit. And you'll see before we get through. <clears throat> and when he comes from the throne, he will execute judgment, not on the assemblies, but on the world. And that day is coming. And that day may be nearer than most of us think. Than most of us think. Let's look closer now at Laodicea. Laodicea. <clears throat> Go back to verse 19 of the third chapter. As many as I may love, I reprove and discipline you. Or I discipline. Then he says, you be zealous, therefore, and repent. Verse 20. Behold, I have stood at the door, and I am knocking this is not an invitation to sinners. He's speaking here to the assembly. And notice what he says. I have stood at the door 
and I am knocking. If anyone may hear my voice and may open the door. Where was Jesus Christ? Not in the assembly, but outside. Where is Jesus Christ today? Is he in professing Christendom? Is he in the average assembly today that is meeting, that is gathering? Or is he outside? Then notice what he says. I will come into him. Now who is it? One who hears. Hears him knocking. And what will I do? I will dine with him and he with me. The Lord Jesus today is outside of these assemblies. And the tragedy is the people don't even recognize it. With all of their religious machinery, they don't even recognize it. They haven't been properly taught, and therefore they don't know. They think he's there. And they don't even know what the so-called assembly is teaching. Just so they get what they want, they're happy being there. Just so the flesh is tickled, they're delighted to be present. Just so they have a part in the work, oh, they're thrilled to death, and they'll give their money for anything that pleases the flesh. Christ on the outside. On the outside. Has the assembly which Christ is building fail? No, it has not failed, folks. Not the one Christ is building. Has not failed? She never will fail. She's genuine. She's genuine. But that's the picture. And it's not a pleasant picture. Notice the last verse of chapter 3. Drop down to verse 22. The one who has an ear, let him hear. So the one who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the assemblies. Three things I'd like to call your attention to in this verse. Some are able to hear. That's number one. Some are able to hear. They've been made able by grace. Secondly, some are unable to hear the truth. They're unable because they do not have grace. And thirdly, some hear what they want to hear. Only what they want to hear. Now let's begin our in-depth study of chapter 4. I wanted you to see the picture of the very conclusion of the assemblies. And by the way, outside of Revelation 1, 2, and 3, the word ecclesia, which is the word for church or assembly, and we like assembly better, I do, is found only one other time in the Revelation. And you know where it's found? Chapter 22, verse 16. There is absolutely no reference to Christ's assembly from chapter 3, verse 22, until you come to chapter 22 and verse 16. Turn to it. Look at it with me. And notice what he says. I, Jesus, sent my messenger to testify to you these things in the assemblies. So beginning with chapter 4, all the way through chapter 19, where we have God's judgment being poured out upon the world, there is absolutely no reference to the assembly, even though, watch this, even though, there are a number of references, and I'll give them to you later, of Christians like the 144,000, a multitude that cannot be numbered, 
the saints of God and so forth, but not one reference to the assembly as the assembly. Save people during that time? Yes. But the assembly? No. That tells you something. What does it tell you? Well, think about it, and we'll be discussing it in detail later. Let's look at verse 1. After this, that's what the King James says. After these things, what things? Assembly things of chapters 2 and 3. After these things, don't forget chapter 1 verse 19 gives you the three divisions of the Revelation. Perfect outline, inspired of God. You don't have to add to it or take from it. There it is, black and white. Now in chapter 4, verse 1, after these things, and notice the word used, meta, that's a preposition. How is this preposition used? How can you translate this preposition by using the word after? It is the accusative. I like the word extent better than I do the word measure. Some Greek scholars use our professors. They like the word measure. Others like the word extent. Doesn't make any difference which one, but I personally like extent rather than measure. So I call it the accusative of extent. That's not original with me. I have found it in my studies, and I do like it better. So extent and therefore after. And there are other instances. Let me give you one in particular where the same preposition is used. It is Luke 5 and verse 27. Yes, Luke 5, 27. We won't turn to it now, but I wanted to give you another reference. So after these things, after these things relating to the assemblies, and keep in mind seven that are named, represent all the assemblies as a whole. Then he says, I saw. I saw. The King James says, I looked. But if you will look, we have Iden is the Greek, and it is an areas active indicative of the verb, or ao, and it means to look, it means to observe, it means to be admitted into the presence of God. So you see, when you look at these words, then you look at the context, and you want to choose a word that fits the context better. Nothing wrong with I saw. But think about this. He was also admitted into the presence of God. And folks, this was not a usual meeting with God. As you and I are having this morning here in this assembly where two or three are gathered together agreeing Christ is in our midst. This is different. I said, this is different. John saw. Who did he see? Did he see the Godhead? The thrice holy God? There are many who believe that. Did he see Jesus Christ, who is the manifestation of God? Did he really see God? Now, I'm going to give you some quotes from others and some from some authors while we're discussing this fourth chapter that uh, are reliable on many things. But on some things, I do not think that they state it as well as it could be stated. So when you say, after these things, things related to the assemblies, I saw or I was admitted. This is an alternate for you to think about. I was admitted into the presence. And that presence being, I was in the sphere of inspiration. I was in the sphere of inspiration. That's no ordinary meeting. I have never been, folks. And you have never been 
You've never had that experience. I've never had that experience. I've never been in that position. And you haven't either. And no other human being other than those who have been inspired by God to give us the Scriptures. Do you buy that? God breathed. John couldn't make a mistake. He didn't make a mistake. So he was admitted into the very presence of God in a miraculous way, in a unique way, and that being in the sphere of inspiration. So after these things, I saw, and behold, a door has been opened. A door has been opened. Well, let me give you, let me back up for a moment. I want to give you one quotation, and I won't say who uh, said this, but I took it right from his work. He took the verb idon, which is an area's active indicative, and Indicative mood is the mood of reality. And here's what he said. Quote, Up until now, no man has seen God at any time. In the Old Testament, God manifested himself under some form for the purpose of redemption. In Christ... God the Father was fully manifested. But now the pure in heart shall see God in His essential glory apart from Christ. End of quote. Folks, I take exception to that. Do you take exception to it? I'm not trying to present to you that I think I'm smarter than the man who made that statement. Brilliant man. He has a lot of truth. In fact, his works have been a real blessing to me. But I find I can pick that to pieces. Let me read it again. I want us to really study the revelation. And the revelation, folks, is beginning. We're getting into prophecy now with chapter 4. And I'll surprise you in a few minutes with something else. Let me give you the quote again. This is a direct quote. Up until now, no man has seen God at any time. In the Old Testament, God manifested himself under some form for the purpose of redemption. In Christ, God the Father was fully manifested. He uses John 1.18 as a proof text. In his essential glory, but get this, but now the pure in heart shall see God in his essential glory apart from Christ. I don't believe that. I don't believe that's scripture. So keep it in mind, we'll be looking at it more and more. But I wanted to get you thinking about it this morning. So that's as far as we'll go for the time being. Then he says, Behold. Behold. Let's stop. Here we have a demonstrative particle. And it serves to call attention to something. This demonstrative particle is used 26 times in the Revelation. So we're constantly subjected to behold. Look, see, as God reveals it to us. Twenty-six times. Now, such a vision is certainly worthy of admiration on our part, isn't it? It should be vividly realized by you and me. And I mean vividly realized. And zealously proclaimed. I said zealously proclaimed. If it isn't realized by us, it isn't going to be proclaimed. Now you can tell the difference between someone who doesn't understand what he says he believes. He's not going to be talking about it very much. And someone who realizes it 
He wants to tell somebody about it. So let me say it again. Behold. Demonstrative. Such a vision is worthy of our admiration. It must be vividly realized by you and me. And therefore it must be proclaimed by you and me. And that with zeal. When we find the listener. Then the next step. He says a door has been opened. That's a perfect passive participle. It has been opened. It was open. It was standing wide open. In heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet. Was like a trumpet. And I want you to know this trumpet never gives an indistinct sound. You remember 1 Corinthians 14, 8? The trumpet that gives a distinct sound? God's trumpet always gives a distinct sound. How different it is from my trumpet and yours. Or the trumpet of any human being. We're not perfect. We're not perfect. This trumpet must go forth in an age, in an apostate age. Watch this. You know, as I was studying this, my mind went back to a sermon I preached, oh, probably 15 years ago. It came to my mind in some statements that I made in it, and I looked for the notes on it, and I found them. And it's a good place to give this at this point. A man that I was reading and a man that I have received many blessings from in my ministry made this statement, and I want to give this quote. I found it. He said, It is not now the time to consider how to set the church right. When I read that, I said, what are you saying? And then before I came to any conclusion, I said, I must consider what you have said in the light of its context. And folks, when I did, his statement is absolutely correct. Now let me explain what I mean. He said, it is not now the time. Now we're talking about a voice going forth. A distinct voice. Must go forth. And it must be distinct. It must be truth. Even in an apostate age in which we live. Whether people want to hear it or not. We must make an effort to give it. Because we do not know when there may be one in whose heart there has been a work of grace and he will grasp what you're saying like these letters that we read this morning from this man down in Puerto Rico. He went on to say, it is not now time to consider how to set the church right. Here it is. It is too late for that. In other words, the apostate condition is going to get so bad before our Lord takes us home. You can't do it. Let me ask you this question. Do you think there is any hope? Do you think that we as Christians can set legislation straight today? Come on now, just reason with me. Just be honest with me now. Do you think that the little minority group who understand God's providence and what is being worked out in these last days, do you think this small group of people can change the course of legislation? You can't do it. You can't even change it on your job. 
You can't do it. Too late. Too late for that. Now notice what he says. The question now is, and folks, the question now to me and to you as individuals is the same. Here it is. How can I put myself right? That's the question. Not how I can straighten out the church. Not how I can straighten out society or the political agenda today. But how can I set myself, get myself right? And listen to this. The warning of Revelation 2.5, the first letter written to the Ephesian assembly. You must repent. If you do not repent and do the first works, I'll remove the candlestick. I'll remove the lampstand. So the, the body of Christ is made up. Notice this not made up of an aggregation of Baptist churches, Methodist churches, Pentecostal churches, Catholic institution. The body of Christ is made up of individuals. It's not an aggregation of churches. It's an aggregation of true believers. Now that's the day in which we're living, folks. If I understand the New Testament, and what is taking place in all the Pauline epistles, even what he warned us about, especially in 2 Timothy 2, 2 Timothy 3, 2 Thessalonians 2 and 3, and many other passages. We're living in that day. So the assembly is not mentioned. But we have a responsibility to give forth the sound of the distinct voice of him with whom we have to do. And that voice is recorded for your benefit and for mine. So the lofty position of saints, individuals I'm talking about, may be expressed in the following ways. Number one, we as Christians are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Romans 8, 17. Yes, we are members of the body of Christ. I'm not talking about some denominational institution. I'm talking about members of the body of Christ, Ephesians 1.23. Thirdly, as members, we are destined to reign with Christ, 2 Timothy 2 and verse 12. Number four, as members of the body of Christ, we shall be given the keys of the kingdom of heaven when we're glorified. Matthew 16, 19. And those keys are not being exercised today by imperfect people. Number five. As members of the body of Christ, we shall judge the world. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 2. Number six. Yes, and as the members of Christ's body... We have the promise that the gates of Hades shall not prevail against us. Matthew 16, 18. And last but not least, as members of the body of Christ, we shall be kept from that special hour of trial that is going to come upon the world called the great tribulation. That doesn't mean we'll be spared tribulation. I said the great tribulation. And do you remember last week I told you how many times that adjective great 
Magus is used in Revelation. More than half of the times it is used in the New Testament are found in the book of Revelation. So behold, door open. It stands open. Where? In heaven. In heaven. Now the word heaven. There's more than one heaven. The Bible speaks of three heavens. Paul was caught up into the third heaven. So heaven is used in different ways. Number one. The eternal dwelling place of God Himself. And that's the second verse of this fourth chapter. Secondly, the place of conflict, and that's Revelation 12, 7. And thirdly, the sky, and that's Revelation 6, 13. So whatever takes place on earth was first decreed in heaven. That's where God, that's His abode. Then notice, what we're doing is kind of giving you a running interpretation right now, and we'll get it into subjects later. Then notice, if you will, what He says in verse 1, the voice which I heard, like a trumpet, speaking with me, saying, now what do we have? Come up here. That's an imperative. That's not an invitation. That is not an invitation. Come up here. Notice it's called, this voice is called the first voice. Protos is the word Translated first. And it may mean either the first in time, when you think about succession, or it may be the first in rank. And folks, this is the first in rank. This voice is the first in rank. And since this voice is the first in rank, we better listen. No voice can excel His voice. No voice can take the place of His voice. It's the first voice. So the voice of God takes precedence over every other voice. You know, it's so wonderful to have a standard. It's so wonderful to have the Word of God to proclaim. Now, I realize that unsaved church members and even backslidden ones, they can accuse the man of God of many things foolishly without understanding. They may say, well, he just thinks he's the only one and he's acting like a, a, a dictator. He just expects us to do exactly what he wants to do. If he's teaching the Word, it's not his voice. He's simply proclaiming the voice that God has already committed to him, folks. It's not His voice, it's God's voice. And God's voice takes precedence over all other voices. Then notice, what does He say? Come up. Come up here. That's not the rapture, folks. Am I surprising you? You say, do you believe in the rapture? I surely do. This is not the rapture. Don't take it out of context. To whom was God speaking? To John. You come up here. I'm going to give you another vision. I've given you a vision relating to the assemblies. Now I'm going to give you another vision. And in this second vision, I'm going to show you what will take place after the things of the assemblies. It's not the rapture. Yes, I believe in a rapture, but I don't believe in using verses out of context in order to try to support something. So this is not the rapture. 
we're going to have to bring this to a conclusion, so I want to close with this. There are some who think, come up here. Like when a person dies, come up here. Now, I want to give you something in closing. It's, it's real good. I came across it in some old notes of mine. I don't know when I used it, but it's been a long, long time ago. I don't even remember using it, but I used it. Listen to this. Heaven is near, though hidden. That's true. Heaven is near you and me, though it's hidden. We may be closer to it than we think. I mean by way of death. But this doesn't apply, actually, but they, they made it apply to come up here. But I want to close with it, and then I'll put it in this right context. An elderly woman was asked, quote, Would you like to live your life over? End of quote. Would you like to live your life over? I want to ask you this morning. Now, I ask myself that question. Would you like to live your life over? I wouldn't, folks. I wouldn't. You might say, well, I would if, knowing what I know now, if I, if I knew what I know now and I could live it over, I wouldn't make the mistakes that I made. Knowing what I know now, that may be true. But how many of you would really like to live your life over? I wouldn't. And listen to her answer. Folks, this is, this is tremendous. No, she replied. Then she said, it has taken me this long to get this close to being with Christ. It has taken me this long to get this close to be with Christ. I wouldn't want to live it over and have to wait all that time. Now, folks, there's a lot of truth wrapped up in that statement. Even though it does not apply, and I was using it, showing it that it didn't apply, really, to the context. But I was reading someone's work many years ago came across that, and so they took this statement, come up here, as the Lord would say to one who had come to the end of his course in life, come up here. But that's not what he's talking about. That's out of context. God was speaking to John, and he said to John, come up here. That was an imperative. That was a command. Why? And you have the answer in the second verse. Let's read the rest of verse 1 and then look at verse 2 and you'll see the truth. Come up here. Being airiest, that means at once. You come on up. It's a command. And then he says, And I will show you Things which must occur after these things. So you have the same terminology at the conclusion of verse 1 that you have at the beginning of verse 1. And then verse 2, we'll conclude with this and take up here tonight. Immediately, immediately, I came into the sphere of inspiration. That's the way I'm translating it, folks. And that is the same terminology with the exception on the Lord's Day in chapter 1, verse 10. Same Greek construction exactly with the exception of the words on the Lord's Day. So immediately I came into the sphere of inspiration and behold, 
a throne was set and one sitting on the throne. Now, we'll take up 